Hello everyone and welcome to a new video, which also happens to be the third installment in the series about making my Charles Worth peacock gown. Previously I've made a silk underskirt decorated with cherubs and embroidered stars, and a velvet overskirt covered in hundreds of peacock feathers. And if you missed the videos about those garments, they will be linked down below. In today's video I'll be tackling the bodice, which is made out of remnants left over from the skirts, and decorated with some bows and peacock feathers, because why not? This costume is based on a single fashion plate in the book The House of Worth, which will also be linked down below. This plate provided a good view of the underskirt, overskirt, and veil, and peacock-shaped headpiece, but you don't see much of the bodice. All I could really tell about the bodice is that it seemed to be royal blue, sleeveless, with a very low neckline in the back. It also appeared to have wing-like draped panels hanging from the shoulder, and some sort of texture around the top of the arm side. And what little you do see, I didn't examine too closely prior to buying materials for this project, so I originally bought two peacock colored silks with the bodice in mind. This first one is literally called peacock and perfectly matches the color in the eye of a peacock feather. It's a gorgeous teal dupioni with a slight dark teal shift. I also bought this silk dupioni, which looks dark from afar, but up close you can see it shifts from a greenish shade to a dark blue, very reminiscent of the colors in peacock feathers as well. My logic in purchasing these was that they would help blend the royal blue tones in the underskirt with the deep greens in the overskirt by being a combination of those two colors, helping to pull the two very strange garments and textures together. In hindsight, this did not work, which is why the bodice you just saw in the intro was made from a different fabric, but we'll get to that later. The first step was draping a pattern, then doing several mock-ups to ensure it fit. When I was happy with it, I transferred the draped panels to paper, added seam allowance, and used that as my pattern. The bodice pattern was based on the lines of traditional 1860s bodices, with narrow back and front panels and wide, rounded side panels. I also drafted an optional collar for this bodice, and you can see the markings for that on the paper. Anyway, the bodice pattern was pinned to the darker of the two dupionis on the vertical grain, then the pieces were carefully cut out. I notched all the pieces at the waistline, which was also marked out on the pattern, then I removed the tissue. Now I'm pinning my pattern to lightweight cotton inner lining, once again on the vertical grain. This fabric will function as, well, an interlining, offering support to the silk to prevent it from rippling or warping. I wanted this layer of the bodice to be cut out very precisely, and when pinning a paper pattern to fabric, it can actually warp it slightly, so I traced around the pattern pieces, then removed them, then cut across the traced lines. Now I'm transferring important markings onto the interlining layer, mainly where the boning channels will be, though this will be worn over a corset and the actual bodice won't provide any waste reduction, the bones can help support the fabric so it sits smoothly and stays in place. So I'm marking boning placement at the center back, the edges of the side panel, and at the center and sides of the front panel. Then I'm top stitching 3 8 of an inch twill tape across those markings. Twill tape is just a woven cotton ribbon of sorts, but it's sturdier and a bit more flexible, and it works great as boning cases once the edges are stitched down, so that's what I'm doing. When that was done, all the inner lining pieces were pressed. Then I began matching these silk pieces up with their corresponding interlining layer. Also, I'm not sure if this silk had a right or a wrong side, but just in case, I made sure to mark the side I wanted facing up with pins on all the pieces. And now I'm just pinning the layers together, making sure the marked, hopefully right side is facing up and that all the edges of the silk and interlining line up. Now I'm pinning all those pieces to the actual lining, which is a very thin cotton. This feels much more pleasant than the inner lining and looks nicer too, since it's free of marking or top stitching, which is visible on the inner lining. I cut around all the pieces so the lining was the right size. Now it's back to the sewing machine. I'm stitching very close to the edges of each piece to secure the three layers of fabric together. However, I'm skipping over points where the twill tape was sewn, since I want to avoid sewing any boning channels closed. Then getting the boning in would be hard or harder, at least. Trust me, as someone who has made that mistake by accident many, many times before. Everything was ironed again, off camera, because ironing is lame, and now I'm marking the seam allowance on the pieces, using a pencil and a ruler. This is because I want the stitching to be more precise than the marking on my machine offers. In the case of the back panels, which have very curved seams, I'm also clipping a quarter inch into the seams to give the edge more flexibility to form to the side back panels. This makes it way easier to sew them together without creating puckers. Here you can see me pinning those layers together. I matched the notch up at the waistline first, then pinned outward from that point. 
This was repeated for both back and side back panels, as well as for the front and side front panels. I'm sewing all those pieces together, carefully following the pencil markings for maximum accuracy. Now those seams are all thoroughly pressed, both from the right side of the fabric and the wrong side to make sure they are nice and crisp. And unlike most of my projects where I press the seams open, in this case I press them to the side. The interior seams can now be neatly finished, and for that step I'm using flat half inch bias tape with pre-finished edges and whip stitching it to cover the seam allowances. The whip stitches only pass through the lining layer of fabric, meaning they aren't visible from the exterior of the bodice. This is a somewhat annoyingly time consuming process since literally no one will see it, but it's also pretty soothing. I made a full length coat once where all the seams were finished using a similar method. It took days for that step alone, but it was a pretty great coat, so I guess it was worth it. And this is what I put the bodice in my dress form and hated it. Okay, I liked it in and of itself. It's pretty fabric and it fit, but my plan to join the contrasting fabrics of the skirt and underskirt together with a bodice fabric that incorporates both of their colors did not work at all. Instead, it just introduced a new color fabric and texture to an already super busy design. It didn't really match either the underskirt or the overskirt, and it looked out of place and bad. I thought about ordering a royal blue silk satin to reconstruct the bodice from, but that would have cost like $60 and taken a week to arrive, and I didn't like either of those things. So I repeated all of the steps you just saw, but this time I used silk charmeuse scraps left over from the skirt as the top layer of fabric. I didn't have much left, so I couldn't control the placement of the gradient too much, but I tried to position the pieces in such a way where it would be symmetrical and flattering, and I think it worked. The back panels, however, don't have any gradient at all, which was intentional. I cut them from the darkest parts of the fabric so they would match the little piece of blue bodice seen in the fashion plate. And when I say I repeated all the steps with these pieces, I mean it. The inner lining, the lining, the marking, clipping, pressing, and binding. It was annoying, but I was already feeling more optimistic about my creation. So this time I carried on. The seam allowance for the side seams was marked, then the pieces were pinned together and I sewed across the marking. This seam will also be finished with the flat bias binding, but instead of hand sewing down both edges, this time I top stitched one edge to the seam allowance by machine. The seam was then pressed open, but I didn't get around to sewing the remaining edge of the binding down until much later. Instead, I jumped into creating the piping. Piping was commonly used to trim 1860s bodice and gave me an opportunity to use the velvet from the overskirt as trim to help tie the pieces together. Here you can see me marking approximately two inch wide strips on the bias of the velvet fabric. I didn't do a very good job at this. Velvet is slippery and annoying and I didn't need this to be overly precise, so it wasn't. But anyway, then I cut the strips out. <laughs> Now the strips will be turned into piping with the help of piping cord. Piping cord is usually just rope, like literally any rope will do, but I'm using a batting wrapped in thread which is specifically made for piping and a bit softer than braided alternatives. But literally every other time I have used knitting yarn or rope and it's been just fine. The fabric is wrapped over the cord so the right sides are facing outward and the edges are even with the cord tucked in the fold of the fabric. Then you stitch over top of the fabric as close to the cord as you can using a piping or zipper foot. This traps the cord in the fold of the fabric, creating piping, and the fabric extending past the stitching is the piping tape, which is how you seam it to your garment. Easy peasy. Especially if you're using a less hateful fabric than velvet. And speaking of sewing it to your garment, that's what I'm doing here. I line the edge of the piping tape up with the bottom edge of the bodice, and with the right sides facing each other, I stitch the piping on. Once again, using a piping foot and stitching as close to the cord as I could. I did this quite slowly because there were a lot of corners and curves to smooth it around. Not enough for me to like take the time to pin it first, just enough to be careful about it. Now I'm folding the piping tape inward and whip stitching it to the lining of the bodice. Around some of the steeper curves, I notched the tape to make it easier to turn inward without puckering or straining. Now I'm covering the ugly raw edge of the piping tape and further securing it to the bodice by slip stitching more of that flat bias tape over top. There were points where the piping tape was too wide to be covered by the bias tape and had to be trimmed slightly, but eventually it was all sewn down nicely. Now I'm finally, like I'm not sure why I didn't do this way earlier, stitching down the bias tape that finishes the edges of the side seams to the lining. And now it's boning time. Like I said earlier, the boning isn't going to give the garment magic waste reducing abilities. It's just used to support the layers of fabric so it sits more smoothly, like interfacing, 
but instead of being fusible interfacing, it's strips of steel. I'm marking this steel to the right length, then cutting at that point with tin snips. These days I try to buy pre-cut and pre-tipped boning, since it's about the same price and way nicer and easier to work with. Because when you cut the steel yourself, it's really freaking sharp and you have to make it less sharp. But I didn't have the right lengths in my stash, and waiting three days for it to be delivered was not an option for my impatient self. So I cut longer lengths to the right size, then used a sanding bit on a Dremel tool to round the sharp corners and dull the edge. I remember when I first did this, the sparks really freaked me out, but it's been years and I've never lit anything on fire, so I guess it's not too big of a hazard. Also, it does sort of hurt if you hit your fingers with the sanding bit, so wearing gloves is a good idea. But the aesthetics of bare sparkly fingers is nicer, so the option I went for is probably obvious, even without the visual evidence. I did wear safety glass and a mask though, because metal shards to the face would be a bad time. And in this climate, wearing a mask is more important than ever before. Remember, they are for other people's safety too, not just yours. Except when filing boning then they're pretty much just for you. I taped the ends of the boning as well, so they are even less pokey, then added them to the boning channels. Now I can finish off the arm openings, which I'm doing with a two inch wide bias strip. One edge of the strip is turned inward by a half inch, and the other edge is seamed on with the right sides facing each other, and a half inch seam allowance. Now I'm under stitching the binding, which is when you fold the seam allowance flat and stitch top it, as close to the seam point as you can, to help encourage it to turn inward. And to aid that process further, I'm notching the seam allowance as well, literally taking triangular chunks out of it. Then I could carefully press the binding inward and pin it down, without any visible creases on the right side of the bodice. The folded edge of the binding was whip stitched to the lining by hand. I was worried I might be overly enthusiastic and catch threads from the top layer of the fabric while doing this, which is why I'm using a dark thread, but it looks bad, so I wish I would used a light thread and just been more careful. And now I decided the bodice needed a collar. Luckily I had originally drafted a collar for this pattern, I just wasn't sure if I'd end up using it. However, I did only decide to use half of it, because I'm only adding a collar to the front portion of the bodice, since the fashion plate clearly shows a clean blue neckline at the back. So I traced around the front collar pattern piece, transferring it to a piece of cotton organdy. Much like when I was making the overskirt, this will stabilize and stiffen the velvet placed atop it, serving as a base layer. I cut my cotton collar out and marked the seam allowance on it as well. Then I pinned the collar base layer to the velvet with the right sides facing outward and cut around it. By hand, I loosely basted the layers together around the outer edges. Now I'm folding the bottom edge of the velvet up so it meets the line marked on the base layer, thus turning the bottom edge inward by an even half inch. And that edge was sewn down by hand using whip stitches. I put this on my dress form and played around with various trim options, but none of them worked, so I had to make my own. I did that by first trimming sword feathers to be about an inch long. Then I cut off the ends where the feathers were sparse and the shaft was too thick. I positioned the feathers underneath a one quarter inch wide strip of flat bias tape, then top stitched across them with the tiny stitch length to secure them to the bias tape. I overlapped the ends of each feather so there weren't any gaps, and once my strip had a single layer of feathered fringe, I trimmed off the shafts and excess sticking out from the top of the other side of the bias tape. And then I repeated this whole process again with the same strip of bias tape so the fringe would be twice as thick, and have a second line of stitching securing it in place. At this point the fringe was full enough, but still a bit prone to shedding, so I bound the top edge with 3 8 of an inch wide twill tape. It was top stitched on, then wrapped over the bias tape, then top stitched to the other side. The additional two lines of stitching did this a lot of good, and the feathers were much more secure. I pinned my newly made fringe, or at least some of it, to the bottom edge of the velvet collar. From the wrong side of the collar, I whip stitched the fringe in place. These stitches are going through the bias and twill tape binding, not the actual feathers. The collar was placed atop my mostly finished silk bodice. The top edge and center fronts were lined, then pinned together. When that edge was pinned, I pinned the bottom edge of the collar to the bodice as well. The top edge will be finished with piping later on, but in the meantime, I'm basting the layers together. The bottom edge, however, was stitched down with tiny whip stitches to permanently secure it in place. Now it was time to decorate the front of the bodice, or at least attempt to. The first attempt was pretty sad, 
and ugly, and was scrapped pretty quickly. The next attempt was executed a bit more carefully. I marked the center front with pins. Then I found four peacock feathers and trimmed the shaft so it was just the eye remaining. I played around with their positioning a lot and cut them even shorter. Once I was happy with how they looked, I used pins to mark their placement. Then I used E6000 on the backs of them to secure them in place, and patterned weights to hold them down while the glue sat. This was repeated for the larger feathers closer to the front as well. While that dried, I could work on what I'm calling the wings. Yeah, you heard me correctly, but really I'm just talking about that swath of feathery looking fabric you see at the back of the bodice in the fashion plate. I drafted a simple pattern for this, then traced it onto cotton organdy, which has become my go-to magic velvet minding fabric, apparently. The cotton organdy was then used as a pattern to cut out four identical layers of velvet. One layer of velvet was laid atop each cotton organdy piece, with the edges roughly aligned, then the layers were pinned together. Now I'm really loosely, and poorly, like seriously this is offensive to the term, pad stitching the layers together. I basically wanted to secure them together enough to prevent the velvet from shifting and pooling, but not enough to shape the velvet the way you would when using this stitch and tailoring. I also figured out the direction a bit better on the second wing. This is the first attempt, so it was extra awful, which seems to always be the case with the attempt I end up filming. I'm pretty sure setting a sleeve perfectly on the first try while filming is completely impossible. Or zippers. Yeah, if I'm filming, it is definitely going to end up being upside down or on the wrong side of the garment or both, because nothing creates incompetence quite like trying to look capable on the internet. Anyway, the edges of the velvet shifted a bit in this process. Shocking, I know. So I'm marking the seam line on the cotton organdy instead, which didn't shift. And I'm marking this allowance half an inch away from the outer edges. Then the remaining layer of not reinforced velvet is laid atop it, with the right sides facing each other, and the layers can be pinned together. I sewed the layers together from the cotton organdy side following the pencil markings. The seam allowance is trimmed down to approximately a quarter inch, then the wings were turned right side out. The edges were pinned so they were even and crisp, or as crisp as two layers of velvet that you can't iron it can be. The layers were sewn together with not quite basting stitches, but not as small of stitches as they should be. But at the time I thought they would be fully covered, and we all know that laziness is okay in private. Now I'm marking the pleat placement at the top edge using vertical pins. The wings are pleated down to about an eighth of their original width at the top edge with the help of three half inch wide knife pleats. Now the side with the basting-esque running stitches and the pad stitching will be covered with feathers. I did a few layout tests first before deciding on how many to use and how to space them. Then I cut them to size and began gluing them on, using E6000. My justification for using this glue is the same as it was when making the overskirt, it's just the best tool for the job. The feathers are too stiff to sew through without breaking, and too flimsy to secure on without sewing through them. The original may have featured a more couture method, but glue has existed since 4000 BC, and rubber-based glues were frequently used in the 1800s, so who knows? Anyway, the glue was applied to the shaft of each feather, then working from the bottom of the wing to the top, they were placed and pinned down to prevent shifting or gaping away from the fabric, ensuring optimal adhesion. Since these are prominently placed on the garment, I tried to place them with precision too, in evenish rows both vertically and horizontally, and they were kind of tucked between the pleats so they don't stick out weirdly. I don't really know how to explain it, but it sort of worked. Also, I left the shafts visible at the top, and I did this on the skirt too. The appearance is less noticeable in person, but I also think this is what was done on the original garment, to create almost a gradient effect, and you can sort of see it in the fashion plate. But to pretty them up just a little bit, I took a green chemical-based marker and darkened them a bit so there was less contrast of them against the velvet. By this point, the collar had dried too, so I could add my second attempt at a bow to it, which looked much, much better. It's made from two strips of silk charmeuse, with the gradient carefully placed to contrast against the gradient on the bodice. The strips were sewn into a tube with slanted ends, then turned right side out and folded into a bow shape. Another, much smaller tube of silk was wrapped around the center to finish it off. A few tacking stitches were used to secure the center in place, and a few more were used to secure it to the bodice too. I ended up tacking the loops of the bows at a few points as well, so I had more control over how it draped. Now I'm lining the top edge of the wings up with the edge of the strap on the back panel and basting them together with whip stitches. These did not line up as nicely as I had planned, so there is some overhang and it's a bit… I think the technical term is janky. <laughs> 
This edge was also now extraordinarily thick, like half an inch thick. It took some serious effort to sew up the shoulder seam. So much effort, in fact, that I forgot to record it. But the edges were simply aligned and sewn with the right sides facing each other, any half inch of seam allowance, and quite a bit of force and effort. Then the seam allowance was trimmed and whip stitched to the lining to try and make its extreme bulk more manageable, or at least a bit flatter. Coincidentally, that's also how I feel when trying to lace myself into a corset. Now I'm taking the rest of the piping I made and aligning it with the top edge of the bodice. It was sewn on and I made sure to pivot at the center front so there will be a sharp point there instead of a gentle curve. This piping got the same treatment as the piping on the lower edge. Curves and corners were clipped, then it was turned inward and the tape was whip stitched down to the lining. Flat bias tape was slip stitched over top of the tape to neatly finish the edges. Now the only edge that needed finishing was the center back. I top stitched twill tape over the raw edge, and I cut the twill tape to be longer than the actual edge, so an inch or so extends past each side of it. The excess twill tape at the top and bottom edge was folded inward, then the entire back edge of the bodice was turned inward at the point where the boning was sewn, which is about an inch and a half away from the actual edge of the fabric. All the edges were slip stitched down to keep them neatly in place. Also, if my hands look a little grayer and more corpse-like than usual, it's because I dyed my hair blue, and most of my body in the process. It turns out when you dye your hair red, for a few days it looks like you murdered someone, and when you dye your hair blue, it looks like you, yourself, were murdered a few days ago. Hair dye is fun. Off camera, I marked the eyelet placement about a half inch away from the center back edge, so they were bracketed by steel bones, and they are an inch or so apart. I poked the holes for them with an awl, since I wanted these holes to be smaller than my usual eyelets. Some bodices from this period have really beautiful, tiny, dainty eyelets, and I think I used too many layers of fabric to pull that off, which is partially because I want the eyelets to be well supported, but it backfired when trying to achieve the look I wanted. I guess it's true what they say, you can't have it all. So instead, I have tiny but weirdly thick eyelets. They were sewn with my normal method of using two strands of embroidery thread and whip stitching around the hole until the raw edges are densely covered with thread. I had to use the awl to spread the fibers several times while sewing each one because they kept trying to close up. This made it really hard to get even eyelets compared to my usual method of punching a hole in the fabric then stitching around it. I found it very frustrating, and they don't look as precise and nice as I wanted because of it, but they are smaller and more sturdy than punched eyelets, which is probably a good thing. Now the bodice has eyelets, piping, boning, bows, and even wings, but is it done? No. It needs sleeves. Obviously. Or perhaps not obviously. Technically, it didn't need sleeves. You don't see sleeves in the original, but 1860s garments almost always had sleeves. Without them, the proportions just looked wrong to me. It was like a squat 1880s bodice instead of an 1860s one, so I decided it needed sleeves. I was originally going to have little, almost cap sleeves made from velvet, so here I am tracing the pattern for them onto cotton organdy, which will be the base for them. Then I pinned the cotton organdy to gold lame, which will be the sleeve lining, and I cut the layers out together at the same time. I also made sure to notch the underarm point. I pinned the same sleeve pattern onto the velvet and cut it out once again. The velvet pieces were pinned to the corresponding cotton organdy ones, and these pieces were small enough that I wasn't worried about sagging, so I just basted the edges together, and even that wasn't fully necessary, it just makes the next step easier. And that next step is just marking the seam allowance on the cotton organdy using a pencil and a ruler. The bottom edge is folded up to meet that pencil line and then is pinned down. Then I went ahead and sewed that edge down by hand using loose whip stitches, since it will be further secured later on. I took my remaining feather fringe and pinned it to the bottom edge of each sleeve, then loosely whip stitched that on as well. Now the interior looked pretty rough, so it was time for that lame lining. I lined the top edges and the notches and pinned them together. Then I turned the bottom edge of the lame inward until it neatly covered all the raw edges and the ugly binding on the fringe. And then the folded edge of the lame was neatly slip stitched down by hand. Then said the sleeves were overlapped and tacked together, and this point will be at the top of the shoulder. 
Then they were lightly gathered down using running stitches, but I didn't tie the thread off, meaning the gathers could be adjusted to match the dimensions of the arm size. Speaking of the arm size, the sleeve was pinned inside it, then slip stitched in place. When it was slip stitched down, I went ahead and whip stitched the seam allowance to the lining too. Oh, and then I had to use a seam ripper to completely remove them because they looked terrible. They just didn't look the way I wanted. They were too long and stuck out too much and weren't flattering and ugly. So it's on to sleeve take two. This time I decided to go for a more classic 1860s design of little puffed sleeves. This would also give me an opportunity to incorporate the iridescent mesh into the bodice. And this was actually a suggestion I got on Instagram by a lot of you. So I made a new pattern which is just a rectangle, and used weights to keep it in place while I cut two pieces of mesh from it. Then I laid a single piece of mesh atop the pattern and used pins to transfer the center line onto the fabric, since you can't really physically mark this mesh since the weave is so sparse. And this was repeated for both pieces of mesh. The sleeve was folded in half at the pin line, then I repinned the fabric to secure the fold in place. And once again, this was repeated for both sleeve pieces. I sewed as close to the edge of the fold as I could using matching thread. Then I sewed a third of an inch away from the fold, creating a channel in between the two layers of fabric. I'm matching up the remaining two edges, which is the top edge of the sleeve, and sewing across them. The top layer of fabric is cut to be longer than the bottom. The bottom layer forces the top layer to its dimensions, causing it to puff out and create that poofy effect. To really create that poofy effect though, the top edge has to be gathered. I'm doing that sort of by machine. I'm lowering the tension and using a long stitch length. I only backstitched at one end, at the other I left the thread tails long. But before gathering down the top edge, I'm gathering the bottom, sort of. Historically, a drawstring would be fed through this channel, making the sleeve cuff adjustable. But it's almost impossible to tie off the drawstring of such a short puffy sleeve on your own. So I decided to go for the other adjustable option. Elastic. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Don't yell at me in the comments, please. It isn't visible in the finished garment, and it does such a good job that I'm willing to overlook the lack of historical accuracy. These are being made out of iridescent polyester mesh, after all. I cut the elastic to be slightly smaller than my bicep, then used a bobby pin to thread it through the channel at the bottom of the sleeve. This was super frustrating to do because the fabric has such a wide weave, I kept catching the threads of it on the bobby pin. But I got there in the end and made sure to pin both ends of the elastic to the corresponding ends of the sleeves so they wouldn't get lost in the channel. Now I'm gathering the top edge of the sleeves by pulling on one of the tails of the long stitch length low tension stitching I sewed earlier. The fabric is really lightweight so it doesn't put any tension on the thread. Instead, the pulling of the thread causes the fabric to be gathered. When it was gathered to the size of the arm side, or thereabouts, I tied the thread tails together and cut off the excess. Then I pinned these side seams with the wrong sides facing each other. That's because this was sewn with a French seam, so the layers were sewn together with a half inch allowance, then trimmed, pinned with the right sides facing each other, and sewn once again. Now remember those velvet sleeves I made before that I decided were so ugly and physically ripped off the garment? I actually decided to still use them, because the mesh meeting the velvet collar looked weird, but I cut about an inch and a half off the top of them so they were more delicate. Then I lined their top edge with the top edge of the mesh sleeves and sewed them together. I sewed these to the arm side using the same method you saw before. The only difference is that I actually finished the process this time. So I bound the edge in addition to whip stitching it down. I did this using more flat bias binding that was whip stitched down on both sides to neatly cover the top edge of the sleeves. The downside to the unexpected sleeves, along with the bulk of the shoulder seam that wasn't accounted for in my initial mock-up, is that the shoulder of the bodice fits tighter than I had planned, so it has to sit lower than I had planned as well. I don't mind this, and it's actually more appropriate for the period, but it's less reminiscent of the lines shown in the fashion plate, which is sort of unfortunate. I should probably add a modesty panel to this bodice and tack down the wings, and I'm also playing around with the idea of adding gold stars to the charmeuse part so it matches the underskirt better. But there is already so much going on, I'm wondering if that might be too much? Or is there such a thing as too much with such a crazy project as this one? Should I just embrace it and add them? Let me know your thoughts. And that's actually at the end of the construction-y part of this bodice. I think I'll add the finishing touches on my own time. In the meantime, we can enjoy the glory of the three almost finished pieces together. I'm so happy with how this is turning out, and I think it's a bit of a miracle that the bodice coordinates so well with the wild, mismatched underskirts. I'm glad I followed my intuition and that, relatively, all things considered, early on I switched directions. I can't even imagine this with the green two peony bodice. Incorporating the velvet and the charmeuse together looks a million times better. 
That is all current me has to say about this project, but let's cut to past me to finish off this video. That's all of the peacock bodice construction footage that I have, and those are all of the peacock bodice photos that I have. But I still want to jump on the end here just to give a shout out and thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who make projects like this possible. I know I did a sponsor for the first two videos about this project, but I still never ever would have considered taking on a project of this scale and of this expense without having their support. So if you are a patron, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, and of course I appreciate you guys just for watching too, uh, but the patrons are what really allowed me to do this. So I'm just so incredibly grateful to all of them. So there will be a whole bunch of their names on screen, but I did want to give a special shout out to my top tier patrons who are Jordan Carpenter, Sharon Syrath, Mo Quintana, Courtney F., Doc Cosplay, Sharon Wigham, Alex Perez, Cass, and Tracy Smith. Thank you so much for your support. Those are my top tier patrons and all of these credits are from April, so I'm still far behind, but I'm getting progressively less far behind. So thanks again for your support. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, giving it a like and a comment really helps me out, and I will talk to all of you very soon. Also, as a little spoiler, the next video involves me making this sculpted, realistic clay peacock headdress of sorts. And if you're curious how that went and how I managed it, then you definitely should subscribe and stay tuned. And that's the end of this video for real this time.